I'm Ellen Mary. And I'm Michael Perry. And he's a plant geek. And she's a plant addict. And, and this, this is, is the Plant Based Podcast. Podcast. <laughs> This is more than just a gardening podcast. We'll be exploring the world of plants from every possible angle. We'll be talking about plant-based diets, plant materials and fabrics, the well-being qualities of plants, and giving plenty of gardening tips and tricks. So we'll be chatting worldwide to companies and individuals that are being creative with plants in new and exciting ways. From fabulous flower crowns to foliage-filled lounges, botanical moisturizers to bamboo clothing it's all here and it's all made of plants this episode of the plant-based podcast is brought to you by our friends at veggie pod their integrated raised vegetable garden bed kit makes growing vegetables easy for everyone with self-watering features and protective canopy with veggie pod you'll be harvesting your own produce in no time available in three sizes to suit any garden Visit veggiepod.co.uk and enter PBP10 for a special discount as a PBP subscriber. Okay, so I'm just going to set the scene for you. It's a gorgeous sunny day. The skies are blue. There's barely a cloud in sight. I'm sitting next to Michael, of course, to my right. And to my left is Peter Goodchild, head of Alpines here at Wisley Gardens, RHS Wisley. And... We're sitting on a gorgeous stone bench looking down over water, um, loads of gorgeous kind of alpine and rockery plants. We can even see some carnivorous plants down by the water. There's people walking around, but it's lovely and peaceful, and you can hear kind of the water all around you, and it's absolutely beautiful. Peter, this is like heaven to me. If I worked here, <laughs> I honestly think this would be like my dream job, <laughs> you know. Does that mean you wouldn't you, be working? You, you are so, so <laughs> lucky. No, I, I, yeah, probably. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so we are at RHS Wisley, and it is absolutely beautiful. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about alpines today but first off it would be great to hold on oh my gosh oh this is, oh, this Pe- is dynamic peter's being called alpine is emergency it, is it like a is it like a walkie talkie yeah that's my garden radio sorry <gasps> are, are you needed <laughs> is it like are you being called up for an emergency he's been paged to be do some repotting urgently. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably my team they're probably watching and, they thought and they're, they're, <laughs> <laughs> well you did we wish we could see you where are you if you are <laughs> Looking. Well, uh, it's no problem at all. <laughs> oh, that lady's got a lovely umbrella. I wish I had one of those. Um, anyway, so um, Peter, I think maybe let's start with just talking about the RHS and Wisley and how you got involved and all of that before we get on to Alpines and in a little bit more detail. So just kind of introduce yourself to everyone. Tell us what you do here. Okay, so I'm, as I've said, I'm the Alpine team leader um, at RHS Wisley. Um, so... I started here four years ago. Um, before that, I was at um, Legoland, and we would help um, to design and theme the rides. Um, so they'd put the rides in, um, and then we would plant up around it. So the plant diversity was quite That's quite cool. interesting. That's really cool. Too. Um, <laughs> and then obviously they have Miniland there, which is where the alpines come in. So I always had an interest on kind of small, kind of herbaceous plants and um, alpines. Um, so. And then we'd help with the kind of landscaping of that as well. So it was it was really good fun um, working there. Um, but I got to the point where I really needed to kind of diversify and find kind of my feet in somewhere else. Um, so that's where that kind of what brought me to Wisley. Um, yeah, four years ago, um, and I've kind of loved every minute of it. As as you've said, it's such a beautiful kind of landscape to work in. And we'll obviously talk about the Alpines later on. Um, It was kind of a bit of a a jump into the deep end coming here. Um, Obviously, we had quite a large diversity of plants at at Legoland, but nothing on this scale, um, where (laughs) every bed um, over an acre and a half um, of the rock garden is completely different. And you've got such kind of of seasonal interest coming in um, all the way through. So you'll get to know an area and then you'll be like oh not seen that that's something new um and it'll be the next week that something new's coming up or coming into flower or a bulb's coming in um coming into shoot so yeah so it's it's a it's a it's a 
really lovely place to work. It's and especially for horticulture, it's it's um, it's a great place to learn as well. I think it's one of the prime locations. I've got to say, I always when people ask me what my favourite garden is in the mm-hmm. UK, I often say Wisley yeah. because you've got so many different pockets and styles of garden in one place. Yeah, and it's amazing because you can wander around them all throughout a day and experience all those different styles. Absolutely. Tell us about oh. some of the other like areas here at Wisley. Um, so we've recently added um, the exotic garden. Um, so that's to show um, plants that have an exotic feel to them, um, which people can leave outside all year round. Um, so they've got lots of the dahlias, the cannas, um, and the bananas that they kind of leave um, out all year round. They and you leave can... the dahlias out all year round? So, yeah, a lot of the dahlias they leave out um, all year round because we've got such high drainage here right. and they'll just cover them with a thick mulch to protect them from the frost. This is very topical, very <laughs> topical, because I posted some dahlias um, only today, I think it was, or maybe last night, um, from uh, Hyde Hall, RHS Hyde Hall. Okay. And then I got into this really big discussion about whether you lift the dahlia tubers or leave them in. And in the past, I've grown dahlias for somewhere probably around about 15 years and I've usually lifted them but you still lose some anyway in storage um, and I, le- I generally you know miss some you know you don't I get loads of them so I leave some in they always grow mm. like I always mulch and they always grow sometimes even stronger than the ones I've stored mm. so this year I'm leaving them all in I'm going to give them a really thick mulch my mm-hmm. soil is is very free draining it's quite sandy as well so I'm just going to give them a, quick, a, a thick mulch and leave them yeah I think if you're um, unless you're really sitting in wet all the way through the winter as long as you've got that drainage point and it's you don't sit with the heavy frost all the way through winter as well i think you'll be absolutely fine to leave them in Um, and this is where the exotic garden comes into its own because in the winter when you kind of expect it not to be doing much you can come and see like the kind of winterizing kind of techniques that we use at whistler that's really cool cool. i think a lot of plants in the garden that we often think will die at the end of the season will actually come back the year after i remember when i was at thompson and morgan we we used to trial with rebecca and biden's for example using them in the second year as well and it works you know we're just used to seeing some of these plants as annuals that you have to lift but you don't really need to Uh, and also them House double plants. annuals sometimes do you yeah because they come back the next year did you make that up that's yeah cool. i did that's, that's, cool. that's cool one of the marketing <laughs> phrases i made up during my time at, at TNM, yeah. um, and actually we were just saying about seeing the carnivorous plants so mm. saracenia this is the same thing they're often sold aren't they with house plants so people think they have yeah. to be kept inside but actually you just can grow them outside and leave them they're outside. actually happier outside very often aren't they yeah, yeah so um the saracenia that we've got on the rock garden there are some tender ones from australia um, that won't put up with the the, the harsh wind that we get um, but a lot of them will put up with the like we leave all of the carnivorous bed out all year round so um, we also have uh, nalumbo in there as well which people kind of think of as a, as a tender um, lotus mm-hmm. um, so it's uh, nalumbo um, lucifer so that's it's mm-hmm. the sacred orchid uh, sacred um, lotus um, what's the key with that then does it just have to be pl- deeper is that right yeah so they need to stay in um, at least a foot and a half of water mm-hmm. so if you've got a small pond um, it that's not hasn't got the movement through mm-hmm. it then it will they will frost and die off okay. but where we have them on the rock garden um the water's constantly running through them so it never the, the temperature doesn't drop low enough for the rhizomes to be burnt off okay. so grow lotus in the uk a lot of people don't realize you can even grow them yeah. in the summer in the uk yeah so i mean we saw it when i went over to bonn um in germany and they just had them in big black tubs and they have the same climate as we did. So I was like, well, that's, that's beautiful. We need to grow this on the rock garden. Um, so we bought um, four rhizomes last, uh, no, two years ago, and they've survived the last two winters. So it's, wow. it's really shown that we've got really nice little microclimates across the rock garden um, and that kind of, and it's just making the, the use of those areas. Um, and it's always just trying to learn more about the garden that we look after and kind of, using different plants we've, we've actually grown um we're growing mechanopsis on the rock garden oh, nice. and since i've been here it's always been one of those things that people have said oh no it doesn't work um yeah. but until you try it and really kind of see if it works for yourself in a different area um where you've got those mi- microclimates mm-hmm. it's just yeah. having a bit of fun with it i think that's real that's a key point oh, isn't yeah. it you know so we can go by the book and the book will say no that won't mm. grow but actually just give it a go yourself and see you know we all have different soils and different like you said climatic conditions within gardens so just give it yeah, a go plants you know? are living things you know they behave yeah. you know people we don't all behave the same do we so <laughs> we know michael 
girl. What would be your tips with Mechanopsis, though? Because to me, that really is the holy grail of I'd love to grow on. What were your key, key tips to success? There? So what we've done on the rock garden, so we found a position that stays cool through the um, winter, no, through the summer, um, and that's, in this weather, it's quite tricky. Mm-hmm. And we've tried to find the coolest spot in the rock garden Hot at the moment. It's the hottest day of the year, yeah. just so you know. <laughs> yeah, we're just sitting here podcasting. Um, there I am, just sweating down my back. <laughs> so, um, we found a bit on the rock garden that fa- is right next to a north-facing um, rock, um, so it stays cool through the summer, um, but it also has um, uh, water trickling through it, so it'll stay damp. Um, it shouldn't frost um, too hard in the winter because it's obviously protected as well from the rocks. Um, so it's just kind of having a bit of a play around with it. And we've always found that this particular pocket, um, which is in one of the oldest parts of the rock garden, um, so over 100 years old, has actually kind of got its little microclimate where he's got these big rocks hold holding the kind of temperature at a kind of medium temperature. That's really cool, isn't it? That's really nice, yeah. Can I ask, I want to kind of wind back a bit more, like, in your childhood, were you interested in plants? What did you, what did you, when you first left school, did you study landscape or? Uh, so, when I, so when I left school, I, it was kind of that typical 15, 16 year old. I didn't really know what I wanted yeah. to do. And all my friends went off to university and I said to my dad, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to go to university. And he was like, there is no way it's for you. Like, you, it's really? just not going to be what you want to do. Because I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I was just following my friends. You just wanted to friends. go because they were going. Yeah, because yeah. my oh, friends were going. Cool yeah, I wanted to be <laughs> wanted to be one of those freshers that kind yeah. of go out and have, and have more parties than actually learning. <laughs> yeah, that's not study. Yeah, so... <laughs> I don't my, know, it could be seen as study. <laughs> so my dad um, had a building company um, and he set me up on an electrician's course uh-huh. and I soon found out being six foot as a teenager and just didn't like going under floorboards and in lofts so I um, got talking to the bricklayer um, and he would do lots of landscaping jobs um, after like building the houses for my dad and got involved in the landscaping through that Um, and when we had done the landscaping for the customers they needed someone to look after it so I'd go and work for the customers on that side because I'd planted all the plants and done all the designing Mm -hmm. with the um, bricklayer so it was a kind of a step into a really slow step into kind of horticulture in that sense and then because I was looking after the some of the plants I wasn't too sure about I'd go and ask my dad and my granddad how to look at and how to prune roses and and then kind of really got an interest through that sense I mean it had always been in the background because my mum and dad had big vegetable plots and kind of like nice rose beds and stuff like that but it wasn't kind of some when I was a teenager it wasn't something that I really kind of jumped into as a career it was a cool thing to do then well it wasn't I felt the same don't worry (laughs) but like there's so many Uh, routes into horticulture isn't there that you don't have to go the traditional route like there's so many different ways you don't have to be going there straight off you know you come to it a lot later which makes it even more fascinating it does and you've learnt skills you know with with your electrical work but with your brickwork and landscaping Mm. that you can now bring into horticulture like we're even sitting on a lovely stone bed that you've made you know and so there's so many skills out there that you learn before you can even come into the industry yeah and we're seeing that more and more where we're having kind of they call it like job changes where people go and work in the city or Mm. like kind of what I did that you kind of like right that's the direction I need to go because that's where the money is or that's where my parents are kind of pushing me to and then they're getting to kind of like the 30s 40s and being like actually I've got this kind of calling to go and be outside and work around plants and and there's more of the kind of horticultural therapy kind of um, being spoken about and I think it's that plus that kind of just natural kind of wanting to get outside and away from the kind of like quite dark or kind of sterile offices that we're kind of becoming more used to it's almost like being saturated by like the modern world isn't it and you get to a point like i did i suppose in my when Mm. i turned 30 it was just like i don't want to be in this office anymore i'd always been gardening anyway and then change career and we speak to loads of people that have actually done that mm. or have at least kind of had a, a, a kind of hobby in gardening because their parents yeah. had a vegetable garden or their parents love gardening and then they kind of rediscover it later on and I think that happens loads but it's also to me like it's a whole bigger question of not being afraid to change and I think a lot of people in life feel that they have to continue with the first thing they chose in terms of yeah. career even yeah. friendships and relationships you know you, I look at life as kind of in blocks you know, it will change from time to time. You shouldn't be scared of that because it usually it. changes for the better and that yeah. is exactly 
exactly what you've done. Embrace you've gone from it. electrician to working with the Lego people to being here. At <laughs> but the you're Rock really Garden. like you're it's at amazing. RHS Wisley <laughs> yeah. now, so that's pretty cool. Would you yeah. ever have imagined that to yeah, have happened? Yeah, what was it like coming into this environment? Yeah. Uh, so, so or maybe you didn't even know the place before. No, so I'd been here a few times and seen pictures of my my nan and my granddad here and stuff, and that, so I knew it. As a, from being a child and kind of being around and running up and down the rock garden and such. But it wasn't the kind of mecca of horticulture that people see it as. Yeah. Um, so for me, I came in kind of a little bit blind of how big it was. Yeah, Obviously, better than yeah, so yeah. it took a bit of a pressure off. Yeah. But as soon as I started, I, I got here <laughs> yeah. and people were like, so you, you realise that this is <laughs> it's quite a big deal. <laughs> um, so, th- so then it, well, my, my manager at Legoland, Paula, she said to me, she was like, you realise she went for the same job yeah. um, three years before, didn't get it. And she was like, if you don't go for this, I'm going to fire you because you're mad. <laughs> so, because I went back to her after being offered the job by Matthew and said, I'm not sure if it's for me. What do you think? And she was like, you have to. Like, this is, <laughs> this is massive. Wow. Um, so when I got here, I kind of had a bit of a feeling that it was it was a bit more than I'd thought of. <laughs> but also the team very clearly let me know the pressures of, of, of becoming yeah. the team leader was. Um, so there was pressures, but it's... It's a hard garden not to enjoy being in, and it's that kind of jumping in and learning about the plants and kind of learning how the different habits of the, the just the bulb collections that we have is so vast and learning and working with the team and kind of how they look after those and how, like when they go on holiday what do you do and it's like right okay well I need what, watering routines and when we um, have volunteers in and we have to show them how to repot and it's like right how do you handle the bulbs and it's all it's all the little things that you don't really think of as kind of general gardening yeah. Yeah. when you kind of get into it in a more specialist kind of area like we do with the alpine collections it's kind of it's another world so yeah. it was really yeah. fun to kind of jump in and then also see how much it inspires people we have children running up and down the rock garden every day and even if it's just the one that just stops and looks at a flower and it's like, oh, that's cool, then it's really nice to see. And even if it's like there's another five that are running around on the rocks and kind of trashing mm. everything else. Are they trying to feed their <laughs> <list> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're stuffing it with full of the stones yeah. and you have to come back and tip it out. You've still got the, like, a small percentage that are really enjoying it and getting inspiration from the rock garden and the, and the work yeah. that we're doing. So it's kind of getting... Getting and it's kind of a little bit selfish because obviously it's it's making you feel good about the work that you've done, seeing people enjoy your work. But it's just kind of it, you've got to find rewarding areas of your your job yeah, to enjoy it. So definitely. it was it was cool. It was, it, it's, it's I a have nice to job. just ask whenever you whenever I come to a beautiful garden like this, you never see anyone doing the work. <laughs> so when do you actually do the work? Like when do you weed? When do you mow um, the lawn? Like you never really see anyone doing point. that. <laughs> Oh, where's his team? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll go and ra- like, I'll radio my team. Where is everybody? <laughs> well, currently my team are, are hedge cutting and the volunteers are repotting. So Don't believe it until we see it. <laughs> um, but they are in yeah. there. Because it's so hot today, they're probably in the shade. But yeah. um, we start at 7.30 in the morning, so that's when we kind of do all the machinery work and kind of all the, the lawn mowing and getting right. everything kind of pristine before the visitor comes in. And it's about getting it kind of at its highest point before anyone comes in so you kind of have that magic kind of feel to it sure. it's that kind of yeah. like disneyland feel of everything yeah. just kind of works i mean you go into the alpine house and we change that over every day and we'll change about 10 pots every day but my team will spend three hours before you come in at 10 mm-hmm. o'clock they'll start at 7 30 kind of just getting everything prepared so that there aren't any finger marks in the sand all the wow. all the flowers are looking their best um, we hold seven and a half thousand potted plants behind the scenes, and we Gosh. bring it, the, the the best pots out to show in the display house. So it's wow. it's kind of putting all that work in, so that when you come in, you don't have people kind of doing all the work around you. You can kind of just enjoy the gardens for what they are. Yeah. And they, the, if you look hard enough, you will find the gardeners 
in the beds, kind of weeding and kind yeah, of getting their yeah. head down. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's quite nice. And, and the, like we, we, when we're on the rock garden, we'll constantly get asked questions and it's nice to be approached and have those questions because yeah. I always say to the, like, to the team and the volunteers, there's never a silly question about yeah. plants. And it's genuine interest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. So it's, it's nice to to be out on the rock garden and have that kind of visitor kind of facing approach so it's it's just the kind of the the bigger jobs that we do it's it's kind of maybe before, before people opening. Come in. Yeah. well now i know the answer <laughs> i feel m- very happy um okay i think we should go see the alpines don't you let's go Definitely. and have a little tour around the alpines sure. and discuss them in a bit more detail this episode of the plant-based podcast is brought to you by our friends at veggie pod their integrated raised vegetable garden bed kit makes growing vegetables easy for everyone. Now I've seen you in here before, Peter, because you actually starred on BBC Garden as well in this Alpine house, didn't you? Yeah, thanks for bringing. Yeah, that. <laughs> but it was great because it brought alpines to the masses, and what people don't realise is they're almost like miniature versions of everyday plants. So if you haven't got as much space, or if you do want to grow in a window box or create a sink garden, then alpines are a great choice. And you're going to give us a bit of a tour and tell us more about the concept of what an alpine really is. Hold so. on. Is there a pineapple lily? Eh? There's a pineapple lily. Ah, yeah, look at that. <laughs> yeah, exactly what you were saying when you just said that. You Ellen, know. you have become a plant geek. <laughs> you now get the badge. <laughs> Gosh, it's taken a while. <laughs> Once you're doing spontaneous squeals of new plants, the year in. <laughs> anyway, yeah, let's walk and talk. So, let's yes, see. we have eucomas here. Yeah. It's like um, a little eucomas. So that's part of the South African collection. So um, here at Wizardy, we, we kind of hold quite a broad selection of plants from across the world so that we can fill the alpine house mm-hmm. um, with interest all the way through the year. So... Um, I was saying to you guys off mic earlier that about how the team will come in here and spend um, three hours in here each day and kind of making sure that it's looking its best and how we have like these huge collections. Um, but I think people always kind of have this assumption that Alpines aren't really doing their thing outside of the spring um, and mm-hmm. kind of because they think of like kind of the spring interest of like kind of rock gardens and yeah. that kind of like... Because Alpine, yeah. uh, what's the definition then? Because it's more than just a rock garden plant. Yeah, it? so it's and it's also not restricted to the Alpine mountain regions uh-huh. as well. So okay. it's basically a, a plant that will grow above the tree line. Um, so... Uh-huh mainly kind of small cushioned form that or kind of low growing kind of shrubs that will put up with the harsh conditions that you find on a mountain region like with the strong winds the kind of the deep kind of frosts in the winter so they have like a huge tap root normally okay. so that they kind of store their energy in through the winter and then they'll go through that that period of dormancy especially uh-huh. with the cushions and then the when the um frost well, it defrosts and the, the snow melts, that will bring them into growth and into flower. So the, the, the true alpines that you kind of get in the kind of alpine region um, have a, like the short interest. But then where we're growing them from across the world, so we have plants from South Africa, from Australia, South America, we're kind of picking up those points of kind of flowering times through the mm-hmm. year. So um, at the moment with the Yokomis, they're autumn flowering um, South African bulbs. Um, and then we have the um, Oxalis. So the Oxalis is one of my favourites. It's lovely, mm. isn't it? So I was saying about when I first came here and how kind of a big kind of jump into kind of horticulture it was. Um, these flower from now till kind of November. Mm. Um, and even later if you continue to water them and feed them but it was that kind of sign of like this used to be my kind of like place of calm once all the team were out and working I'd come in here and kind of just enjoy the plants because you could just kind of take in the detail and the oxalis just fill this house later on in the year so it's they're one of my favorites to see because it always brings back that kind of like fond memory of why I stayed here and why i really enjoy plants always bring they do bring back memories don't they there are certain plants that really make you kind of remember a certain point in your life or a feeling even it's lovely and you've got like the cyclamen um 
per, um, perpurescence and the hedrofolium, the um, graecums, that all come into flower in the autumn. And then obviously you've got the um, cyclum and coom that come into the spring. So it's not just a kind of spring thing of kind of like, right, that's what alpines are. They're kind of like spring interest. And it's, I think people are kind of always kind of really surprised at how well we fill this house with colour and, oh, colour yeah. and foliage interest as well. So we have quite a large fern um, display as well. So we have um, the <laughs> taking a picture of me. <laughs> Michael's taking a picture at Sorry. the same time and we're already sweating. Multitask. I'm holding my hair up I'm and we're trying to keep this me. together for you. <laughs> we're sweltering away. Story of when some Koreans were trying to film him hoeing. You're not an actor yet. <laughs> no. um, yeah. So yeah, it's just having that, that kind of that low growing form and if if you were to to get into alpines and you you're really like a beginner i would say the kind of starting block for everyone is a sempervivum if you can kill a sempervivum you've done well because they will put up with most things yeah. um and then the, the, there's a real kind of joy of seeing them flower and having the offsets that you can... They look like aliens when they flower, so unexpected. And they just come out like... (laughs) And because they're monocarpic, people feel that they've killed them after they've flowered and they've seen the best of it. But because they've got their offsets on there, you can pinch those out and plant them onto another pot and give them to your friends or keep them for yourself. So they're a really easy one. And whenever we get work experience students in, it's one that we kind of like, right, have this to take home with you and go and enjoy it and like kind of this is a kind of and it's that kind of giving someone that memory to whenever they look at it they're like oh remember that amazing time we we spent on the rock garden with the alpine team and and hopefully it's kind of that inspiration that will get more people into yeah that's really really nice but alpines they're they're always a lot smaller than the standard version of plants Mm. is that because of the more inhospitable conditions they're growing because above the tree line more wind more kind of yeah so that's so they grow as big yeah well they've adapted to so it's the the species that they've adapted into kind of the low growing form so they're they're kind of wind battered they're kind of they've had to go through the long winters to be smaller yeah i mean there's a great example here because look this is a nareen and usually a nareen is a big pink garden plant that grows along the wall of bungalows. Yeah. Most of the people that <laughs> yeah. really love nareens. They've just planted thousands that's around that, the new that's entrance. That's beautiful awesome <laughs> colour. No, gorgeous. but it's sometimes got that kind of preconception. But this is a dwarf nareen, which is, yeah. really you know, half the height. The flower's it's half really the size as well. And, it's really lovely. And that's what I love about alpines. Is that, that a lot of the time, they're nice, small, delicate plants. And, uh, mm. One right underneath here, again, a nareen. Oh, wow. But, but a white one. Even half tiny. the size again. Yeah, and it's just that. Yeah. So these are from... From South Africa, um, from Table Mountain, and they're kind of really kind of they, they've just adapted to kind of put up with that kind of blasting wind through them. So they have to be low, otherwise they just get knocked over. Yeah. Um, and then obviously when they go to seed, the wind will catch them still and spread the seed. It's incredible how plants evolve, isn't it? You know, yeah. they know they they have their coping mechanisms. Uh-huh. Look at that one. I found you a cushion to sit on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not quite. It's a little bit spiky. This, this is this is a mother of all dianthus, right? Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> people always look at this and they're like, "Oh no, you've got the label wrong," because they know what a dianthus <laughs> looks like. It looks like, like the dianth. Yeah, it looks exactly. Like a bean, bean bag. <laughs> yeah. It's really spiky. And it, I do quite enjoy it when children <laughs> run up to it and put their hands on it, thinking it's moss, <laughs> and then they get this sharp kind but of like ow. stick back. But so this is um. Um, a dianthus erinacaceus and it's a really kind of typical alpine it's kind mm-hmm. of like a it's our centerpiece to the alpine house it's about just to describe it's about three feet across two feet wide and one foot tall and it is a dense mass yeah. of stems and leaves it is incredible. yeah so these are individual rosettes um and they're kind of it, that this is how they grow so th- this is a kind of perfect mm-hmm example of how the wind would hit it and just roll over and then the the snow would just sit on there and it would kind of spread the weight um but also as it kind of going going through the kind of summer temperatures in the wind in the night time the the water will hit that and it'll catch any bit of moisture in there and roll into the center so it's kind of it's got its own little microclimate and we do find we had one in the landscape house which is next door that it's the kind of perfect 
catch for kind of cyclamen and any seed kind of rolling across it mm. and it just creates these little microclimates within the cushion so then you'll find these odd kind of cyclamen coming up out yeah. of it as well the plum. yeah oh. so it's, it's kind of creates its own little world really cool. um, which is really nice as well what else have we got coming oh, over I gotta here i got to tell you hypoxis. there's a lot of these about in the trade recently there's mm. a few new varieties a few doubles and they call it little rose lily grass, don't they? It's yeah, so these are... I've got quite a few of these growing yeah. in my little alpine Ooh, crate. Awesome. They're very pretty. They're lovely pink flowers. Yeah, so we've got quite a large collection of these. Um, and they're, again, from South Africa. Um, really good plant. And they're great if you've got good draining soil. We've got them on the rock garden. We used to cover these up. And we moved the bed that they were in. So we, we moved them so they were a bit of, uh, on a ledge so that children didn't run across them. Mm -hmm. And where we had left some uncovered um, from the move, we'd left them over the winter and they were flowering perfectly well without the cover. So now we don't cover them over in the winter and they, they actually enjoy that kind of like the dampness around them. As long as they've got the drainage and they don't sit in like kind of solid wet, then they're perfect for a garden or kind of to add to that kind of late summer interest. So again, kind of learning as you go as well, realising yeah. there's different and ways to care for plants outside yeah. of the textbooks. Yeah, and it's, that's one of the things, it's kind of that misconception that because we work at RHS, we yeah. know everything, and we're always developing and learning new uh -huh. skills and kind of it will always be updated. And because of the climate's always changing and kind of getting warmer or getting yeah. colder in the winter, uh, it's just kind of adapting how we work around it and kind of what we can add to it for new interests. Okay. I've got a question there then, kind of like in terms of RHS, say if you were here growing a road of hypothesis and mm. you realised that it needed... Slightly different conditions to what was printed in RHS books. Would, how would you go about that? Like, because would you then instigate a change somewhere down the line, or because? Yeah. So when they kind work? of do, we work with the the teams in the science teams as mm. well quite closely. So they're constantly doing research on how okay. we're looking after to get our the collections. Best advice. Yeah. yeah. So and if. The advice teams, like, so when you, if you're an RHS member, you can write in um, for oh. advice and use the advisory team. Um, if they've got something that's quite specialist, they'll yeah. always contact myself or the team okay. to kind of get yeah. the kind of most up-to-date knowledge um, so that cool. they're not kind of being misled. And obviously, we're in the south of England. We're kind of in this kind of, like, little microclimate yeah, of its own. Lucky, really. It's quite yeah. dry through the winter. <laughs> Um, so we're quite lucky to be able to grow the plants that we do on the rock garden. But I think it's just getting out there and, and just trying out a few places mm. on your garden or in, on a pot okay. and just moving them into different sections cool. of the garden. So what kind of tips have you got for listeners? If they want to kind of start their own rock garden or start to grow alpines, what's the best way to go about it? So if you want to grow alpines, what I would say, the one thing to go away with, and I've kind of mentioned it a few times at the moment, like today is, that drainage is key. Yeah. Um, alpines don't want to sit wet and they don't want to kind of be kind of in this kind of sodden environment. But one thing that they do want to do is have um, a kind of cool root system. So what we do, um, and we've put up a few pictures as well, but the, they want to have the pots in a plunge or kind of have so that you can keep the the sand around the pot damp yeah. so then that keeps the roots and that's cool exactly what you're doing that makes yeah. Sense. yeah so then if you're thinking about so you're basically replicating what we're going on in, in nature so yeah. they would be growing in between two rocks quite deep down in the ground so their taproot would be in between these cool rocks so what we're doing is keeping the sand plunge damp so it looks quite dry on the top but an inch down it's actually really wet um, well not really wet but it's kind of damp so it's nice and cool through these summers so it's keeping the tap root nice and cool and the root systems nice and cool so the bulbs aren't drying out or the root systems aren't drying out so that's the kind of main thing um, if you're growing a rock garden well building a rock garden of your own there's there's all sorts of rules and kind of making sure that it's kind of looks natural and you've got those kind of steps so that it's kind of all the rocks are kind of facing the in the same kind of topography so that it doesn't look like you just Tipped a, tipped a load of rocks. <laughs> 80s rock garden. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's just making sure that it's natural but also workable. Uh -huh. um, you need to be able to get access on, it. access it. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to have roots through it so you're not kind of just chucking all the rocks down and you can't actually <laughs> weed it when mm. it, you do have weeds. Like any garden, really, you need to have access points for it to make sure that it's 
kind of maintainable. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of going back to like the Alpine collections, what we do, tend to do, because the Alpines are kind of, the bulbs mainly are um, quite kind of prone to rotting off. We check them each year, so repot them, put fresh soil in and kind of make sure that they've got a lot of drainage around them because as you're watering, it will separate the soil from the grit. So you'll end up with this line through the pot if you leave them over a, um, like five years or so. So we tend to repot them every year or every other year just to make sure, one, the bulbs are in good health but also to kind of freshen up the soil, make sure it's not kind of drying out too much. Okay. It become, otherwise... It's a really deep drainage. Yeah, drainage. Drainage, drainage is drainage absolutely key. Yeah. And what about the best starter plants? Like, I think you, you always... Like, dianthus is always one that ends up in an alpine yeah. garden, isn't it? Yeah, I think for, for, like, rock gardens. So there's this, there's this kind of idea that you, you have to grow alpines on a rock garden, and it's not always the way you can have kind of low growing um, herbaceous plants so like helianthemums um, erigeron you can always grow <laughs> so it's it's having the right plants in the right place making sure that it's kind of and kind of like low growing so you've still got that feel of like an alpine yeah. kind of scenery that Creeping you're creating rosemary, yeah it, yeah really and it's beautiful. just like over the rocks is lovely and semper vivums and um saxifrage like in between all the rocks is I really you nice you don't like saxifrage did you tell me that you know, like, like <laughs> no i do like more choice ones i like south side seedling okay it's a nice one with the bicolor flower um they used to be what we used to sell that was all white almost like bridal white okay. as well that was nice but of course they need to be kind of really almost like vertical don't yeah they? so because that's where it's so those. that's where it's perfect yeah. to like when you're you if you're building a rock garden having where where the two rocks meet and you, you're always going to end up with a small crack in between and you can pack these in between mm -hmm. so they're on their side and kind of like growing down the cracks and they'll end yeah. up spreading across and i think it's just a you're not always going to please everyone with the plants that you grow. And we found that out at Wisley that people will come and criticise um, and then the same, like, the same day you'll have a group and they'll love that area yeah. that you've planted up. Yeah. And it's just Welcome fine. Well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's just finding the plants that are right for you and that yeah. you can go and enjoy. Um, you said about loving an origaron. Some of them are quite invasive. So if you can get out there and weed out the, the mm -hmm. seedlings, then great, that's fine. But are some also of them pretty but bossy? They are. Yeah. <laughs> Just like you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no, my silence. I'm actually faint. I can't talk anymore. I'm so hot. I'm yeah. literally well, unable well, to talk. Actually, the second part of this little mini tour, we're going to go actually behind the scenes and we're going to look at the plants cool. that are brought into this main alpine house. So we'll get to see some real treats behind there. Let's Brilliant. go. Okay, we're behind the scenes now. But only quickly because you're moaning about being hot I all am the time. So, I, actually, outside here you get a bit of a breeze but yeah. when you walk inside with the fans off so that we can record, it's a bit stifling. Mm. But anyway, yes, yeah, so we're behind the scenes. So this is where it all happens, where people don't see what goes the on. Um, so what goes on here? What do you, what do, you do? Uh, so this is where we store our plants um, ready for presentation. So they spend the majority of their lives in these um, sand plunges. So the pots are plunged into the sand as i said to keep the roots cool mm -hmm. um either whilst they're in growth or as i said about the bulbs to make sure that there's still some moisture around the bulbs but they're still kind of like they're not sitting wet but kind of staying cool yeah um so we're currently looking at what's called the elliot house um and this is where we kind of store our kind of more choice plants and also our cushion plants so what we were saying about our like how an what an alpine looks like this is kind of like the prime example of where to come to really i got told off for touching one but i just like i get up close and personal with the plants i'm but just fascinated you didn't just touch it you pushed it into <laughs> it it. <laughs> it was that cushion there which is a gypsophila right yeah <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Michael's dropped his phone. Um, Everything stopped. So Michael's yeah, dropped so, his phone. So yeah, look, look at that. So yeah, this is the Gypsophilia um, arteroides. So um, it's as I said about the kind of small um, kind of rosettes. So this is kind of microscopic kind wow. of rosettes, Ellen, look at this. and it's Literally. just That's like amazing. a kind of 
It's about uh, 30 centimetres wide by about 15 centimetres tall. But each little leaf yeah. is so a you've got a, across. Yeah, so you've got these rosettes, and when it flowers, that will flower across, so each rosette should flower. On a good year, it will flower like as a whole kind of bowl and it will look like a big ice cream, basically. It's amazing, it really is stunning. Sheesh, that is just... So we've got a few of these, and, and the size of the rosettes on the gypsophilia will also depend on how much we water it. So we've got one of the same species there, um, with slightly larger um, rosettes around the edge, and that's where you can see where the water we've watered it a little bit more. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the, the yeah. rosettes have grown a little bit bigger. Um, but it's, it's still garden. very small. It's uh, they kind of look like small hills and yeah. kind of kind of mountain tops. It's like through. a mini mountain range. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> Imagine little kind of stories on there. Like I want to live on there. <laughs> <laughs> but this is where, like, when we have children come through and kind of like the work experience students, kind of really can grab their imagination of like how fun it would be to work here. Like working around these kind of like really interesting yeah. plants yeah. and plants that you wouldn't just kind of like you wouldn't find anywhere else um, there's, there's a few gardens in the country that grow these plants like we do so um, it's, we're, we're quite kind of, kind of well we're, we're pleased with what we do but we're also very kind of I don't know, it's just a, a real joy um, to work you around. I can tell. Yeah. I can <laughs> tell that you love it here, and it's clear like your knowledge and passion comes through entirely, and it's absolutely awesome. So this one here, uh, Peter, are you on this? It looks kind of funky. Yeah. What's that all about? So again, so what we were saying about the kind of small growing kind of alpine form. So this is um, Euromus japonicus. And it's a really low-growing um, Euronymous. And it's quite compact. We all, when we repot these, we will kind of do a bit of kind of light pruning on the roots. So it's slightly bonsai'd um, in that sense. But where it would be growing is in these kind of like tight rocks in between. So it would be constricted anyway by the, ro the, the rocks. We do the root pruning so that we can keep it in a kind of the same size pot because otherwise we'd end up with these huge roots and a kind of small plant um oh, and so, so I just it's used to that because it's used to be an yeah, environment as yeah yeah well. so we we need yeah. to kind of restrict the roots and the size so that we can actually go out and display it in the display house because otherwise it would just take up too much room we wouldn't be able to lift it but also we wouldn't have the space for it as well so um over there, I can see tons and tons of bulbs. So, What's going on over so there? So, in our larger display, well, in our larger collection house, we've uh -huh. got our Narcissus collections, our National Crocus collection, we've got Iris, we've got the um, Louisia collection, which is quite large, and it, some of them are really large Louisias. Um, but then also we've got a rather large saxifrage collection, which I know that you're not too keen on saxifrage, so I thought <laughs> we could go and a I liked. have a look at those, because they're the Let's kind of more mound-forming uh -huh. um, plants that we've got. Um, sure. And we've adapted the, the frame that they're in, so that it's mm -hmm. kind of getting a lot of shade. We keep the plums cool that they're in. Um, but it just means that we can kind of have that kind of added interest. Uh -huh. um, and we've been working with Cambridge Botanical Gardens on how we look after them. And my, one of my team, Tom, who looks after this collection, has been doing a wonderful job making sure that they kind of put up with the changing environment. That uh -huh. we have. Um, so we've got a, quite a broad collection. So we've got the mossy saxifrages here. Yeah, um, they're the ones I don't like, don't they look yeah. a bit messy? And I think that's mm. the people this have time of year, but yeah, yeah. give them a chance. Kind of, they, they have this browning off and they'll go green on sides. Yeah. Um, but then we have the more kind of mound forming ones, uh -huh. um, which I, I really enjoy. And again, they're kind of similar to like the um, dianthus uh -huh. that we've looked at I mean, the display house with their kind of cushion form. And that we've um, grown them around bits of tufa as well because mm -hmm. be, that's what they'd naturally be growing around. Okay. I was going to say, they look like little mountain ranges. They yeah, look like yeah. they are kind of yeah. out there, don't they? So it's, it's just really trying nice. to create these kind of uh, natural displays so that 
we can show people how, like, if you do end up with these dead bits that you're poking again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <Get out. laughs> luckily, that bit was dead. But we show people what you can kind of, if you can cut them out carefully, uh -huh. then you can replace it with these bits of rock just to fill it. So you've uh -huh. still got a nice display. Okay. Um, and it's just having those kind of, kind of, we have to have, like, as I said before, it's just filling in the, filling the display house all every uh -huh. day continuously basically. changing yeah, it yeah. we don't have a quiet day at Wisley so it's it's always trying to grab the public's attention so we're, we're trying to find new things that mm -hmm. we can do who gets to choose them though you or you choose as a team because uh, so that must be a really fun part of it yeah, yeah. so it's, it is, I think it's one of the best jobs um, yeah. the students do it as well so when the students are on a rotation round the garden and when they come onto Alpine we we'll give them the opportunity to basically look after the display for a week uh -huh. so they get to kind of choose the plants and cool. and that means that they get to work around the plants and get to name like yeah. look up, learn their names and look after the plants like kind of on a one-to-one -one basis mm. um, and also the team when we don't have students will do it so they're on a rotor so we look after like on morning duties like I said before about getting the garden and the display house looking its mm -hmm. best um, the team will work on a rotor so that they spend a week looking after the display house. And you can always tell who's doing the display because they'll tend to pick their own plants that they look after so that it's kind of making their own kind of identity and their own mm -hmm. plants kind of yeah. stand out. That's cool. Just quickly Whoa. then, behind us, we've got this massive bench of cyclamen. How many have you got here? Like... Uh, there's about 300 pots of cyclamen. So these are the kind of hardy cyclamen that we have, so mainly heterofolium. Um, but then we also have the tender cyclamen um, house as well, which have right. Af Africanum. Mm -hmm. right. And we've got some really kind of real showy Africanums mm. as well with like huge leaves, which I know the, um, the local groups love. So, it's, it, wow. and again, so we said about having displays in the collection house, but we also go to shows as well and right. kind of support the lo local mm. gardening groups as well. So it's, cool. it's a nice kind mm. of... I love it. What a cool too. place to be. Mm. It's just ace, isn't it's it? It's like a plant world, but in miniature. <laughs> it is. I mean, you know, like Legoland? Yeah. Could it not be like mini plant land or yeah. something? Yeah. I you think know? you brought a bit of Legoland here. Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> You've got your perspectives all mixed up, Pete. <laughs> Thank you very much for, you know, being here with us this afternoon and no taking a time out. It's been Thank really you. cool. Absolutely. Not quite cool, but cool, you know. <laughs> Hey, MP. I'm going to press record, OK? We're on, we're, on, we're on record. Good. I'm making a vegetarian chilli because I'm a vegan now, Alan. You've suddenly turned vegan. You actually just said you were making a vegetarian curry, which is slightly different, because it oh, might oh, have yeah, dairy in it. <laughs> Don't get, catch me out in the loopholes all the time. <laughs> Honestly, I'm making an effort. I've just chopped red onion. Yeah. I'm about to go with a yellow pepper, green pepper, yeah. and loads of beans, because I love beans. Nice. So it sounds very good. You're a better cook than me, then, for sure. I'm a what? A better cook than me. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> but the thing is with you, Ellen, I never get it, because on the surface you look as if you'd be a good cook. <laughs> <laughs> like, everything suggests, like, this girl can really cook, but then you come down to it and it's like, you really can't. I've got, like, do you know, my uh, web even said to me that it's been very unfortunate the days that I've cooked for you. It's turned out really badly. <laughs> <laughs> like for me. Yeah, when you've been here and I have made us food, it's no, never it's really, always been fun. It's eh? never really been that great. But <laughs> I'm actually really I can cook. I'm better at baking than cooking, but I can cook, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> anyway. Oh anyway. Um, um how did you get on with your um didn't you do some live cookery demos? <laughs> yeah, I done cookery demo at the handmade festival and uh, it went it went really, really well. I really enjoyed it. Were you having it. a good cooking day there? I was having a good three <laughs> cooking days there. You're so cheeky. <laughs> um I know also that um, Michael was invited to a party and it would appear that he thought the party was at my house. So he was kind Who's of a, party, what? he was kind of a little bit like, you know, um, I don't know if I can make it or not. And then when I told him that we were eating out and going for cocktails all of a sudden he was more interested. <laughs> <laughs> I just realised what story you're telling of me, which is really random. <laughs> so clearly Michael doesn't like my cooking, but it's not that bad, I promise. 
Yeah, um, but I also wanted to see the guest list first, you know? Well, I'm not <laughs> going to show you the guest list. It's a surprise. Uh, I just but you know what? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm quite an instinctive cook, so I just kind of do it as I go along. Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's always a success, but it means that I kind of like, if it goes wrong, I can like, mop it up halfway. Yeah, that's how you learn now, I guess, as well, isn't it? Yeah, I guess you know? so. So just to put everyone in the picture, currently, because uh, because we're both around and about and travelling and whatnot, yeah. we're recording this gossip via Skype. And yeah, we are, because we're flash. Because <laughs> we're flash. I'm watching Michael in a kitchen making a chilli, and he's watching me in my office. Oh, my, my peppers re- are frying. I hope they're not too noisy. <laughs> repotting houseplants. I've got noisy peppers. Got noisy Get step outside for a minute. <laughs> oh my goodness! And all I can see is your beard as well on the screen. I know. Sorry. So yeah, um, busy bees. Yeah, carry on. We need to talk about something sensible. Well, we've just done we've this lovely this chat, podcast, haven't we? haven't we, with Peter yeah. Goodchild? And what's it about? Um, it's all about. Uh, how do you mean? Chance, what's it about? All about alpines at RHS Wisley. Oh, so they're small plants. You're very funny, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> they're really basic terms. <laughs> they're like plants for people now, that um, can't cope with anything bigger. <laughs> oh gosh. If that's what you make of alpines, then yes, <laughs> of course. But no, alpines are lovely plants. Yeah. And uh, the gla- the alpine houses at Wisley are fabulous, aren't they? So nice. Oh, yeah, definitely. We had a right old dig around the back, didn't we, darling? We had a good old dig around the back, yeah. And, uh, I remember what happened as well. What Do you happened? remember what happened? What happened? Do you remember we had our, one of our first public arguments? Did we? <laughs> Did we? Do you remember? What do you mean a public argument? It was so awkward. What you happened? Really pissed, you really peeved me off. I get told if I say swear words in this podcast too much, our editor has to bleep them everywhere. But yeah, do you remember? What happened, Ellen? Um, I finished... Like You're being a, pretty bit bossy. I, fin- <laughs> I finished a like podcast recording sooner than Michael would have liked and so when I stopped recording Michael was like oh you finished it too soon I don't like that I'm not happy about that (laughs) (laughs) yes you did (laughs) that's exactly what you said (laughs) of course (laughs) and it's it's sometimes really hard in English culture you can't really say what you mean so it's like it always comes across aggressive even when it's just putting your opinion across. Yeah, you know but that I mean? was fine. So, and so I just said, okay, yeah. well, you oh, no, know. I don't want to argue about it again. And now. so we just recorded more. <laughs> uh, so it was no the, problem. The, the tone of your fine. It was fine. no problem, Michael. You're making a great big drama out of nothing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, yes. Um, it was good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was actually. Um, yeah, we learnt a lot. It's kind of, it's great because there's like alpines of almost every plant. There's kind of a smaller version and they're the plants that have obviously kind of grown up on mountain sides, kind of like higher altitudes as well. So they kind of physically almost can't grow as big. So when you want to grow those in the garden, they're immediately more space saving. They need a little bit more care in terms of drainage and all that jazz. But yeah, it's kind of fun. I think alpines can be the... Well, Michael's just cut out then. I didn't press stop, honestly, but you just cut out then, Michael, sorry. You just said alpines could be the new... Oh, I just said loads of interesting stuff. No, it stopped where... just after you said alpines could be the new... You've forgotten what oh, you said. alpines could be the next big succulent. That's it, that's it. I think, yeah, like, in the past, the generally, when you think of planting up something to do with alpines, you think of dianthus, don't you, that kind of thing. But, na- but actually, yeah. there's so many other species of plants that you get in miniature form i think some of the first outdoor plants i bought were actually alpines i think like when i was a kid i just liked how kind of small and cute they looked i remember having some small mimulus some little hypericum as well so oh, cute. yeah it was kind of where i started as well to cute. be honest it's a good place to start and it's pretty trendy at the moment michael's just showing me his nose and eye really close up. Oh, I was just Which it's back to my face in the mirror. I forgot you were there. Yeah, I can see <laughs> up your nose. That's just quite a few grey hairs. Not through. really <laughs> a good look. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> <Ain't no problem. laughs> anyway, um, 
Yes, so we had a really lovely trip. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Peter was a fabulous host. So if you do get the chance to go and look around RHS Wisley, do not miss out on the Alpine houses. And do not miss out on Peter. He's very tall, so you probably won't. <laughs> you, won't you won't miss Peter, yeah. He's a great guy. Oh, it so. really annoys me when I meet people that are taller than me. Really? It's like, this is my thing. <laughs> yeah, it really annoys me when I meet people smaller than me. <laughs> <laughs> that can't be often. <laughs> <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh it's very nice chatting to you now you're doing yeah. the now you're doing the plant geek pose on the stairs probably taking am, a photograph yeah, this is a, of us uh, yeah. a common place for me to be so yeah i'm just i'm kind of like trying to have a few days relaxing but it's really frustrating i just want to fly away no not really but yeah just picking up on loads of admin and stuff but i actually i came back to the house on what was it, Tuesday morning? I haven't actually left the house since then, and it's now Thursday morning. That's terrible. <laughs> You'll have I cabin have fever. <laughs> You'll have cabin fever. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, it's good for me as well. You know, I can never quite understand what to do for the best, because, like, you're saying I should go out, but then, like, at the, on the same token, people are like, oh, you need to chill and relax, you know, so... I don't know. <laughs> but you can chill and relax by just going for a walk. You don't have to actually be doing anything, you know, just get out of yeah, the house, I'm get going some for air. Yeah, I'm going to walk later. I need to get a haircut, so, Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't have to involve work, does it? Hey, no. actually, this week that we're recording this gossip is uh, Hug a Tree Week. So you can go and hug a tree and post a photograph, please. Cool. Yeah. Great seat. Do that. Can I hug an indoor tree because of my rule of not leaving the house? <laughs> no, you need to hug an outside tree. Oh, damn it. Oh, yeah. how's, my chili, how's my chili doing? I've actually got you in the fridge now. I'm basically um, having a tour. Do you think a harissa paste will do the same job? Not sure. I don't know. Mm. I've got no idea because apparently I can't. Well, I ordered so much from Ocado, seven types of kale. It's a dream. Seven types of kale? Yeah, well, actually two, but it's better for the headlines if I say seven. This is how I. This is how I. This is how yeah, things go with Michael. To <laughs> okay, I think it's time for you to carry on with your chili yeah. baking, and I'm going to get on with repotting my yeah, little house like, plant. Don't make out like I'm like being distracted. You're actually potting up a monstera as we speak. I am potting up. <laughs> Loads of Gone are the days of being devoted to each other. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, don't, we don't love each other anymore. Um, you don't forget though, you are gonna be at my house sitting very soon, so you're gonna be in oh, charge of my house. I'm excited. Plans. What do I need to do? Are you, I bet you're gonna leave me a, a bossy list. Don't I'm you? gonna leave you a list. Yep. <laughs> A little cool. bit. But really, there's not much. I'd just really like you to water my house plants and um, in the garden if needed. Yeah? Thank okay. You. That's it. That's cool. I will do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so I'm much. Yeah. It's an annoying house because it's four floors and you always forget something on the floor above. So. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> but it's good for my fitness, you know. I won't need to leave the house. I'll just be fit going up and down the damn stairs. Every day I feel like I've done a step class, so that's how it goes here. No. <laughs> it's awful. awful. Okay, peeps. <laughs> nice chatting. Right, signing off. We're going to find a way to soften these peppers. Go and grow some alpines. Uh-huh. Okay, love you lots. Lo oh, you do love me. See? It's all in jest. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Today's podcast partner is VeggiePod, the integrated all-in-one garden bed suitable for anyone interested in growing your own. You'll be amazed at how quickly your vegetables grow in a VeggiePod, and as a special offer for our listeners, VeggiePod are offering PPP subscribers 10% off any sized VeggiePod when purchased with a stand or a trolley. Simply go to veggiepod.co.uk and enter PBP10 on checkout. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Plant Based Podcast. Have a browse of the rest of the library or hop on over to the website, which is theplantbasedpodcast.net. You'll also find our social media links. Please connect with us and let us know about any plant based projects that you think we should be covering on the show. And make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you'll be the first to hear the next episode. We're releasing once a fortnight. So until next time, enjoy the world of plants.